Okay, well, um, I see some folks are still joining, but it is 1201. Um, with folks joining, I think I will go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know, I'm John Wilbeck, the Executive Director of the Board of Engineers and Architects. Um, this is our, um, our next installment in the board's webinar series. Um, and what we're going to cover today is uh, code of practice and technical submissions. There's been some new rules introduced recently um, that have to do with uh, what you put on technical submissions. Um, but there's also um, wanted to go over some uh, sealing procedures where you put the seal. Um, and so some of those work together, some don't. So what I'd like to do here for you today is go over um, these provisions and the rules, and we're not going to really touch statutes uh, much at all today. Um, this course, um, the board, uh, I do anticipate giving credit for this webinar. Um, of course, the board doesn't pre approve any offerings, um, but that being said, um, we will uh, give information to everyone on attendance verification so you can potentially use that for CE activities. So let me get started here and see if I can remember how to run PowerPoint here. Uh, roadmap for this presentation is we're gonna cover um, some of the provisions of using the licensee seal. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit also about the coordinate, coordinating professional. Um, what that is, that's kind of a unique provision here in Nebraska. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also have a new rule, like I mentioned, on Rule 6.5, which has to do with information being on technical submissions. And we also are going to cover a little bit about project remediation. Um, some of you licensees may not know about remediation and what that is, um, but I'm going to cover that um, because it could be, uh, you, you could be potentially helping a lot of owners um, with their projects through the remedi remediation process. So I'll cover that here as well. Um, just very briefly, wanted to go over who the board, uh, the current board members are. Uh, our chair uh, right now is Brian Kelly, uh, architect uh, and UNL faculty member at the College of Architecture. Uh, Jason Salter, uh, professional engineer and structural engineer is the vice chair uh, here in Lincoln. Uh, Alan Wadey, uh, architect, uh, he works at UNK in Kearney, Nebraska. And then Lenore Isom, uh, architect, Jan Bosselman, PE. Brett Foley is our public member. Uh, Bruce Dvorak, uh, who's the PE and also uh, faculty at the University of Nebraska uh, College of Engineering. And Dan Teal, uh, professional engineer. So those are the current board members. Um, you know, we've been around since 1937, um, as you all know, as licensees, what this board does and the staff, we enforce the Art Engineers and Architects Regulation Act, and we outline the requirements for licensure as an architect and a professional engineer. So just wanted to briefly reintroduce to everyone who the board members currently are. Uh, again, what we do, uh, we establish requirements for those who practice to make sure that those who do practice are qualified. Uh, we do enforce provisions dealing with the practice of engineering and architecture in Nebraska. And just a reminder to everyone why you have your license is to safeguard life, health and property and to promote the public welfare. Um, so just want to do, I always like to put that reminder in uh, on these types of presentations that you're uh, on the front lines, uh, protecting life, health, and safety out there. Um, first topic I want to talk about is the licensee seal and the use of it. Um, the the ENA Act, the statutes say that licensees have to procure a seal, and that seal is put on work that constitutes the practice of architectural uh, of architecture or engineering. Um, one of the more recent rules that the board has introduced um, talks about direct supervision of work. So the statutes say that any work that you personally have done, um, you obviously can put your seal on that work. Uh, the statutes, however, also say 
that you can also put your seal on uh, work that's done under your direct supervision. And so we had some uh, not questions, but the board a few years ago wanted to flesh out um, what exactly constitutes direct supervision of work. What what uh, parameters or requirements have to be met for licensees to be able to put their seal on work that was done under their direct supervision. So what the board did was um, it convened a, a subcommittee made up of board members um, and came up with four uh, conditions that all have to be met for someone to be able to put their work or put their seal on work that they have direct supervision of. Um, the first is probably the most important thing to remember, uh, and I'll go over this. Uh, so the first is that licensee has to have and exercise the authority to review and change both the work in progress and the final work through a continuous process of examination, evaluation, communication, and direction throughout the development of the work. And you can see a couple of words in that uh, rule section high, um, italicized. And I wanted to point these out because what this means is you have to be able to um, uh, review and change both the work in progress and the final work. What that rule does not say is that you, you licensees only need the authority to review and change the final work product. The board wants to see if there's a question, the board wants to see that the licensee has been involved from the beginning of the project to the end. And this is very important to remember because this really gets to the heart of what you may know as uh, quote plan stamping unquote out in the uh, out in the industry and so uh, licensees who are in direct supervision of work have to show the board if there's a question that they have been involved in the project from the project conception to the end okay so that's uh, probably the most important thing i want you all to take away from this particular slide um, you have to be involved from the beginning you can't just uh, get engaged at the end, review it quickly, put your stamp on it, and be done with it. Um, so the board is going to look for that. Um, you also have to be personally aware of the project scope, needs, parameters, limitations, and requirements. Um, if there's any questions about um, some of the architectural or engineering decisions made as part of the design, part of the construction, uh, any part of the services that were provided on the project, uh, that licensee has to be capable of answering those questions. Um, finally, the licensee has to be reasonably satisfied with that product, and they also have to accept full responsibility of the work. And I will add that the board has the final authority to determine if a licensee um, conducted uh, the appropriate amount of um, uh, oversight when they're directly supervising work. So the board is really the final arbiter uh, if something happens on that. So just again, wanted to to bring over that again, a relatively new rule, um, but I think it's it's worth discussing. Uh, use of the seal. Let's talk about the use of the seal a little bit. Um, the licensee uh, identifies uh, all the work they prepared uh, by applying their seal um, to technical documents. Um, one type of technical document is drawings, and so you can see. Um, the, the act and the board rules say that licensee puts their seal on each drawing. Um, and if, for example, if there is a project where more than one licensee um, had their, you know, had information on that drawing, each licensee would put their seal on that drawing and it would have to be clear to someone looking at that drawing sheet, which licensees was responsible for what work on that pro on that drawing. A um, little bit differently when it deals with other things that are not drawings, uh, things like specifications, reports, studies, other documents. Um, what the Act says about sealing that work is you seal that on the first page as well as the last page. So you don't necessarily need to seal every uh, page in that report. Um, what, this, what the Act says is you seal the first page and the last page. 
Um, I have gotten questions in the past, uh, for example, you know, the uh, architectural firm is putting a big project together. Um, they've got some engineering consultants. They're all putting together a spec book. Um, how do they necessarily seal those um, disparate, you know, they could be mixed up in the, in the different divisions of the project. Um, you can approach that a number of ways. Um, number one, you can, you could do this, uh, you know, you could seal and wherever each licensee's work stops and a new licensee, like a new spec section, um, they can put their seal on that section and, uh, and that seal would essentially be good until the next licensee spec section. Um, that's one way you could do it. Another way is you could, ha uh, have like a, uh, not a cover page, but a, a appendix maybe up more up at the front that has all the licensee seals noting which spec sections they, they worked on. Um, the bottom line when it comes to that is um, as long as it's reasonable, as a reasonable person can figure out um, which licensee is responsible for what work and the appropriate seal um, notes that, um, that's, um, I think, is, uh, satisfies the intent of the rule. Okay, going to address some questions here as they're coming up. Um, how does the board address changes in personnel on the project? Uh, the PE leaves the company towards the end of a project. Um, in that case, um, there should be some discussion, and I, I apologize, I don't have a lot of material covered for that. There should be some discussion about transferring work and there should be a clear transition, maybe a letter or something that becomes part of the project documents that notes that this PE or licensee was, was uh, prepared this work, but that PE had left and now there's a new PE in charge of that work. There should be some paper trail that shows transferring of uh, responsibility. Um, and I think, um, that is how that should be handled. Um, David asked, what about structural calculations? Normally you have a cover sheet and seal the cover. Uh, the last page may be a calculation for analysis. Uh, wouldn't make sense to seal that page if we're not sealing the other like pages. Um, I would think typically, um, you know, a calculation, it, you know, what the act says about sealing, um, it, the act says that every drawing sheet has to have a seal. Um, I would say that structural calculations fall under the, under this category, the other documents. Um, again, I would, I would apply some common sense there. Um, yeah, absolutely seal the cover sheet. Um, last page may be a, be a calculation. Um, but usually if you have a set of documents, um, seal the first page and then seal the last page. I think that better complies with the act here. Um, uh, Jacob asks, what's the best way to seal specifications when sections are intermixed? Yeah, I kind of went over that. Um, there's a number of ways you could do it. Um, you could, you know, each licensee could seal each, uh, spec section. Um, you could have that one page or, or however many pages sheet it takes where all the licensees note which spec, uh, spec sections they worked on with their seal. Um, again, as long as a, a lay person looking at it can determine which licensee prepared that work, again, I think that satisfies the intent of the uh, intent, uh, that rule's intent. Uh, John asks, why are some municipalities also requiring an electronic seal on top of our licensee seal? Um, that is a question that I can't answer. That is really a municipality. I can only address what the ENA Act says, um, and I can't address or, you know, we don't have any power over municipalities. So um, if they have additional requirements um, that are above and beyond the ENA Act, there's really nothing our board can do about that, unfortunately. Uh, Dale asked, does first page, last page seal requirement also apply to each individual spec section, many of which may be written by various disciplines? Uh, again, I, I believe, you know, just apply some common sense here and, and use your best judgment on, again, it, it, as long as a, a 
you know, a, a typical person can can understand which licensee was responsible for what work and the appropriate seal is applied. Um, I think again, you've satisfied the spirit of the rule. Okay. Um, very briefly, uh, wanted to also talk about um, what we used to call prototypical documents. Um, which are design documents prepared for projects designed by licensees and other jurisdictions. And these really apply to things like, you know, think of your, you know, uh, I'll date myself and use the, the Pizza Hut example or the McDonald's example, you know, using a stock plan um, and uh, using that kind of stock plan on a, another site. Um, the original licensees, of course, have to provide written consent for that. Um, if you can't get that, um, you can provide a written explanation of why the circumstances prevent you from getting that permission. Um, revise the documents if you need to appropriately. Um, and of course, review them for compliance with all applicable codes and ordinances and uh, building codes and whatnot. Um, and the Nebraska licensee would accept full responsibility of the revised documents. Um, Chris Solt is back on um, sealing for a calculation. Is a seal on the last page of the text or the last attachment or appendix? Um, I would say you would, um, if that appendix is, an, is, a, is a piece uh, um, of that document, um, that if it went away, um, it, like it's an integral part of that document, I would consider that the um, you know, seal that um, if that happens to be the last page. Um, Bill asks, is an electronic signature permitted in lieu of a handwritten signature next to the seal? Um, I believe the rules allow um, for electronic um, signatures. Um, that should be in Chapter 6. Um, I don't have that on hand right now, but I would review Chapter 6. I believe, believe they are uh, allowed. Um, they this, are. Yes, yes, go ahead. It's Amy. Yes, they are. Um, it's 613. Embossing, computer generated, or other type of seal, as long as it's valid. Or right. uh, that it's legible. Sorry. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, before I move on, Steve asks, uh, let's see this question. If I complete an independent third party peer review of design documents, do I need to put my stamp on my summary letter? Uh, you're not the engineering of record. Um, I'm not completing analysis. Um, are you performing? The key is, Steve, are you performing work? Is, is the work that you're doing considered the practice of engineering? I mean, does it meet the definitions in the ENA Act to be the practice? If it is, uh, then you would have to put a seal on that on that uh, summary letter. Uh, Shelley asks, "How do we include municipal standard specs in the submittals, where the municipality has may or may not have stamped them?" Um, hopefully, I'm going to get to that question later on. Okay, let's move on to coordinating professionals. Wanted to talk briefly about this. Um, the coordinating professional provisions are somewhat unique to Nebraska. Um, they really outgrew, um, they came about uh, because the board heard from some building departments that they weren't really getting, getting coordinated project documents. Um, you know, the structural engineer might submit one day Two weeks later, the structural engineer might submit documents or drawings and, you know, there's ducts going in shear walls. Um, and then the architect um, would submit later or the other licensees. So the board kind of came up with these querying professional provisions. I wanted to note something important um, in the querying professional provisions. Uh, a couple things. The first off, the querying professional has to be a licensed PE or architect according to the ENA Act as recognized as such by the project owner. Now, I will say this about querying professionals. 
The Landscape Architects Act, which is a, another separate board, also has coordinating professional provisions, which say um, landscape architects, uh, or let me back up, on projects that involve landscape architecture, a landscape architect can be the coordinating professional on a team with architects and professional engineers. That is not at odds with the ENA Act at all. So I wanted to, to bring that up quickly. Um, but also the project owner has to recognize that individual as the coordinating professional. Um, the role of the coordinating professional, they really have to do three things. They coordinate communication between all the design professionals on the project that relate to producing those technical documents. That person is also the go-to for the building official. So if that building official has questions, it's really a flag for that building official to say, if you know that that coordinating professional is that building official's first point of contact. Um, finally, the coordinating professional's uh, role is to verify that all design disciplines involved in a project are working in coordination with one another, and that changes made to the design are approved or done by the corresponding discipline. Unlicensed entities cannot act as the coordinating professional. Lumber yards, contractors, uh, unlicensed uh, architectural interns or engineer interns, or uh, someone totally unrelated like a project manager, if the owner hires them. If that person is not a licensed architect or PE, and again, I'm gonna go back to the e a Regulation Act, um, unless that project manager is a PE, um, I, they cannot be the courting professional. Um, and I believe, um, oh, never mind, I'll skip that part. So any questions about courting professional role? Um, again, they don't, the putting the, uh, the courting professional has to put their seal on certain places in the, in the project documents that does not indicate responsible charge or direct supervision of work. They use a certain phrase that they have to put in conjunction with their seal and identify themselves as a coordinating professional on that project. Um, so that is all I'm gonna talk about on coordinating professional. Any questions on that? Um, I do see um, some other questions about sealing standard plans and plates. Um, so Joe has a question. So a project owner cannot hire professionals separately. Um, let me crack open the act here. Um, I don't believe the courting professional has to be a, uh, they don't have to provide, yes, so I'm, I'm looking at the statutes, 8137, 3437.02, which says the coordinating professional may, but need not provide architectural and engineering services on the project. So yes, Joe, the, the project owner can hire uh, professionals separately, um, you know, to manage a project. Um, in that case, that, that individual could be the coordinating professional um, but again, if that's the case, then they would have to comply with and do all the things that are required of them in the rules. Uh, Patrick asks, can you talk about corning professional responsibility when owner wants MEP design build? Again, I, I believe design build is just a different project delivery method um, where the MEPs are you know, involved with the contractor early on uh, again, if there's a project that involves more than one uh, licensed uh, architect or professional engineer, one has to be designated as the coordinating professional. And so the owner has to be made aware of that. That's a provision of state law. Um, and so, you know, if, if that MEP design build firm is working on a project that is subject to the act, that requires the involvement of engineering uh, licensed, uh, licensed professional engineers, then per state law, one of them has to be designated as a coordinating professional. 
Um, can any person be according professional as long as they are a PE and familiar with the with the project? Example, can electrical engineer endorse plan drawings? Again, the coordinating professional's role is to not take design responsibility for anything. So the electrical engineer is not going to seal, for example, architectural drawings. Um, they can coordinate that architect's work with, the, with his or her own work as the electrical engineer and with the other licensees, but they are not uh, assuming responsibility for that work. Each licensee is going to do their own work. Um, the the coordinating professional is just to, going to coordinate the design disciplines involved. Uh, the coordinating professional, Brian asks, uh, adds the statement with their licensee seal in places. Is it a different seal than their discipline license? No, it is not. Um, you use your uh, architect seal or your PE seal and just have that, um, that language uh, right below it or right next to it saying that I am the coordinating professional and you might want to draw a box around that too. So it just kind of, it sets it off as it's as a uh, unique and, and whole thing. Uh, so a landscape architect may act as coordinating professional. Just wanting to make sure I heard that right. Um, <laughs> uh, again, the, the Landscape Architects uh, Regulation Act I think it's called the Professional Landscape Architects Act, has provisions where uh, landscape architects can act as courting professionals if the project is a landscape architecture uh, project. Now, what the, uh, that act does not say is what constitutes a landscape architect project. Is it just 1% of the project is landscape architecture? Does it have to be a majority of it? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's not contained in, in either the Landscape Architects Act or the ENA Regulation Act. I do know that the Landscape Architect uh, Act does say that landscape architects can be courting professionals if it is a quote landscape architecture project unquote. So yes, Anna, you heard that right. <laughs> uh, James says state law does not require MEP work sealed by a PE. Is a coordinating professional still still required to coordinate that work? Um, I believe what you're asking is, um, if if there is a project uh, that is not like let's say it's under the threshold for um, let's say let's take the example of a let's say it's a business project under three thousand square feet. In that case, the ENA Act doesn't apply to those activities. Um, so, you know, so anything under the, the thresholds in the exemption matrix, my understanding is that the act doesn't apply to those. Um, so on exempt projects, no courting professional is really needed. Um, and in the same vein, no licensees are really needed. Um, licensees, of course, can work on that if they want to. Um, on exempt projects, but my understanding is that you don't need to uh, designate querying professionals for exempt projects because the act doesn't legally apply to those projects. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, moving on, um, wanted to talk about the new rule 6.5 um, technical submissions. Okay, so this is a new rule that talked about, um, uh, well, it refers to information that should be um, placed on tech, on documents. Um, so this rule, which is really rule, I believe, um, let me go to it here, 6.5.1, um, technical submissions that constitute the practice of architecture or engineering shall include both the name and either the address or location of the project on the cover on each drawing and the cover page and or first page of specs, reports, studies, and other documents. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about address or location. Um, be specific if possible. 
uh, as possible. Um, you can use a legal description um, if the street address hasn't been determined. For example, you know, if you're building a new project and the, and the Postal Service hasn't really given you an address to it yet, um, you can use a legal description for that. Um, again, it, it kind of goes back to use your best judgment and common sense here. Give enough information to give a reasonable person the ability to find the project. Okay. Um, and again, that's um, so you put that name and address or location on each drawing. Yes, that has to go on. And I think most of you may do this anyway in some way, shape, or form, um, at least the name of the project. Um, but the, the rules now require that either the address or location um, go on each drawing and the cover sheet and or first page of other documents. Um, APN, uh, Doug Gibson asks, I'm not familiar with that. Um, that um, yes, latitude and longitude could work too. Absolutely. Again, that's um, that could work as well. Assessor's parcel number. Um, those could, I believe, again, I'm not a, I'm not an attorney for the board, but if that is specific enough to be able to give a reasonable person the ability to find that project, it could, it could. Uh, Doug asks, what should we use for a long linear project? For example, an interceptor sewer that is miles long. Um, interesting. Uh, that covers a wide area. Um, you know, again, this is, I wonder if you could use maybe the start and end, end points for those. Um, that's just one idea. Um, I've never, or I haven't come across that question yet. I might follow up with the board on that. Um, what guidance they could give on someone for a long linear project like that, Doug. So I can get back to you on that. Um, and then uh, some other uh, information uh, regarding, uh, depending on whether or not the work is, is or is not being performed through an organization. Um, if it is being, is not being performed through an organization, uh, the licensee's name and contact information shall be included on those technical submissions. Um, if the work is being performed through an organization, uh, put the organization's legal name or DBA doing business as that organization's contact information and the organization's certificate of authorization number. Um, put those on those technical, technical submissions. Um, it makes all of this information the board has found as it's this really all these new rules really stemmed from um, some compliance cases that the board was seeing. Um, that they were really struggling um, with licensees remediating the project, and it wasn't clear to the board um, reviewing the documents if the licensee worked for the organization or they didn't, or who was actually really involved in this in these pro uh, projects. So that's really kind of the catalyst of where all these new rules came about. I will grant that these rules are relatively new. Um, and if the board sees that there are some potential changes um, that need to be made to the rules, I mean, the board will obviously take that under consideration. Uh, quickly, Justin asked a question. If the work is not done by an organization, but as an individual, does the individual need to register as a firm with the state? Um, if that individual is not working through an organization, no, they do not need to register as a firm. Um, that brings up something else that I wanted to cover here for everyone. Um, if you have, if you're, uh, if you work as, let's say, a, a licensed professional engineer uh, opens up an LLC, and they are the sole uh, employee of that LLC. Um, and they have no employees. Um, if that LLC, uh, that is a legal organization. So even though they have no employees, 
that is an organization under the laws of Nebraska. So if that licensee is practicing through a sole proprietorship organization, like an LLC or a PC, um, they still have to get a certificate of authorization. Now, on the flip side, if that organization has an LLC, but they don't practice through that, maybe it's for a hobby that they have, um, but they practice uh, architecture engineering only as themselves, they do not need to register with us uh, and get a certificate of authorization. So if they're not doing work through an organization, no. What they would do is put their name information along with the address and location and the name of the project, um, but they would not need to put this, this information because there's no organization uh, which wouldn't have any contact information or a CA number. Um, organization means um, there's an example um, in the, uh, actually there's a definition of what is an organization in the ENA Act. Organization means a business entity created by law, including but not limited to a partnership, LLC, corporation, or joint venture. Um, basically, um, we, we, we had uh, written a newsletter article a uh, number of years ago, eight years ago, almost, I believe, um, which really helped explain that was actually written by uh, one of our public member on the board at the time who happened to be an attorney. Um, but if you're um, really, it has to do, I believe, with liability. Um, if that LLC is shielding some of your personal liability through it, um, chances are you may need a certificate of authorization. Um, authorization. Um, through Secretary of State or through Architecture Board or both. My understanding is um, you have to work with both offices. You work with SOS to set up that organization itself. And then if you're going to practice engineering or architecture through it, um, once that is, is established, then you can come to us to get that certificate of authorization. So that's, um, you kind of have to work through both of those things. Um, Craig asked, is working through an organization or submitting as an organization? I'm assuming that this is to prevent persons working for an organization that are unlicensed. Um, again, this it, you're starting to get into some areas of the uh, practice that are really tough to know uh, or address without um, real clarification on details. Like, um, does, first, I would suggest look at the contract. Uh, if you have a written contract and the contract is with a client and ABC architecture, then it's pretty clear that um, ABC architecture LLC, it's pretty clear that there's the practice of architecture is happening through an organization. So, yeah, Amy says we have additional information on our website to assist a person with determining if a CA is required. Um, John asks, is the authorization number yearly expiration deadline or one time? How those work is um, the certificates of authorization are issued for a two year period. And they're really, it, they're not like uh, individual licenses who expire on December 31st. It's really whenever we, if we issue a, a certificate of authorization today, um, uh, April 5th, 2023, that certificate of authorization will be good for two years from that date. So it will be good through April 5th, 2025. And so we continually um, are getting uh, see a, a certificate of authorization renewals every month. Um, so those, again, they just, it, it depends on when that certificate of authorization was first activated. Uh, Jeff asked, does the board have jurisdiction over federal projects completed in Nebraska? <laughs> uh, that question, um, again, is probably above my head to answer. Um, I, I know there's some, uh, some issues of uh, federal preemption and federal um, work taking priority over state, um, so I can't really uh, address that question. Um, Jim asked, do the CA numbers change? Uh, potentially they could. Um, normally they don't. Like if you, if an organization has a C of A and they renew it on time, they'll keep the same number um, all throughout the life of that. Um, but if they, for some reason, let it expire, and that does happen, 
um, you won't get penalized or the, the organization won't get penalized for it um, unless they're practicing um, without needing it. Um, but let's say there's an out-of-state firm who got a C of A to pursue a project and maybe they got that project and kept a C of A for two years and then they, they didn't do any more work in Nebraska. Um, but then 10 years later, they came back and they got another, they uh, heard of another project and wanted to reauthorize their uh, certificate of authorization. In those cases, they would probably get a new C of A number. Um, but generally, if that organization re renews on time, um, they'll keep that CA number. Um, John asks, are we okay to do advertising contracts without prior to the authorization? If so, assuming just license and state is the clarifier. Um, I would suggest that it's probably, um, there's some rules that talk about well, they don't specifically talk about C of A's, um, like pursuing work in a state where you don't have a license or um, don't have a C of A. Um, that's back in Rule 5.6. Um, so that really talks about, um, you know, individual use um, or individual authorization. Here's what I will say about the board has looked at this uh, in the past, John. The, what the board wants to see is before that agreement is ex or once that agreement is executed, like if there's a written agreement that uh, XYZ Engineering Inc. is uh, signing a contract with a client um, on, a, on April 5th, 2025, the board wants to see um, when that contract is fully executed, that organization better have a C of A on the books on that day. That's how the, the prior board iterations has, have looked at that issue. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay, um, <clears throat> this uh, slide is really, um, and if you wanna take a screenshot now, please do go ahead. Um, uh, of course, we'll we'll provide a PDF and we'll post this in other this presentation in other places. But this is kind of an overview of of information or seal um, where it's supposed to be put on drawings and where it's supposed to be put on specifications. So, for example, the seal of licensee prepared the work. You put that in each drawing sheet and you put it on the cover first page and or last page of specs reports, studies, and other documents. I would note that the information, you know, that's required in new rule 6.5 um, isn't really congruent with the seal provisions uh, earlier up or in, in rules chapter six. They're not really congruent because they don't talk about the same things. One is, is purely the seal. The other is the other information about uh, the licensee's name, contact information, organization information, CA, um, they're not really congruent. So um, the compliance officer, Amy Habe, and I um, kind of broke down for you all to see where you put um, uh, certain information. Um, one of the specific questions we got um, prior to this presentation was, does the querying professional CA information need to be on every page even if they aren't sealing those pages, pages, and the answer is no. Um, the coordinator professional only puts that on their cover on the cover sheets of drawings and the cover sheets of specs. So, um, use this as a reference. Um, and yes, we will make a presentation. This presentation available as a PDF, uh, along with some other places too, which I'll get to. Okay, let me again try to figure out how to forward the seal. Um, another, the other new rule in rule section 6.5 is about using jurisdictions uh, details in a drawing set. Uh, if you do use those, um, the board requires that you put the name of the jurisdiction which prepared the standards. Um, I will say um, <clears throat> this rule when the board wrote it, 
We went through a lot of uh, iterations of this rule. Um, I think some of the earlier ones uh, had a lot more um, requirements tagged to it. Um, but at the, at the end of the process, the board, I think, wanted to start with something simple. Um, and so they simply said, if you use those standard uh, details, um, drawing specs, um, make sure that the jurisdiction who prepared those um, that information or those documents is noted. Um, <clears throat> very briefly, the last topic I'm going to cover is remediation. Um, remediation is a process specified in the rules um, where work not done in compliance with the ENA Act um, can be brought into compliance uh, with the Act. Uh, again, the process is described in Rule 8.4.1.1. And I'll talk a little bit about how this, how the board becomes aware of these projects. Usually we get, uh, we get word of these projects through partner agencies, like uh, building departments, state fire marshal, um, uh, HHS, um, other agencies who bring projects to our attention that um, you might want to look at this board. Um, there's a project that uh, potentially could be subject to the act. So what we do is we look at it at the board to see if the project's uh, parameters, the size and occupancy classification primarily um, would require that owner to engage um, architects and or engineers. Um, so once we see a project that has um, that according to staff, yeah, probably need licensees on them, we'll initiate a complaint and I'll be the complaining party uh, in, the, in that process. Um, so we send that to the board. The board reviews the circumstances uh, surrounding that project. Um, if the board believes that that project is a good candidate for mediation, uh, it'll generally follow a few steps. Uh, <clears throat> first, the board has to authorize it. Uh, they have to authorize the owner to begin architectural and or engineering remediation. Then what that owner should do is engage licensees to bring them onto the project and review that project for design deficiencies. It could be um, even, it could be a set of drawings, it could be even under construction. Um, but what those licensees do is they review the project and they, they uh, identify any design deficiencies like code deficiencies, whatever they are. Um, if the licensees find deficiencies, that all, uh, the licensees should recommend design uh, solutions, and then that owner has to implement those and correct and remove those deficiencies. Um, then once the licensees confirm that those deficiencies are corrected, they write a letter to the board, they seal it, and if the, uh, the licensees determine that there's no more uh, design deficiencies in the project. Um, the board will accept those remediation letters and basically dismiss the case. Again, it's a process of, of bringing in projects that should have had licensees involved in them. Um, bring them bringing those licensees in, they review it, uh, they make corrections if needed, and they confirm that those corrections are done. Um, we do maintain a list um, that we that is a resource available to owners who might need a remediation. <clears throat> if you or your firm is interested in uh, assisting owners with potential remediation, uh, please contact us because we will get you on that list and we provide this list as a matter of course to owners who need their projects remediated. So this email address, nbea.compliance at nebraska.gov, um, do send an email to them um, if you want to get on that remediation list. Uh, Don asked real quickly about sealing standard details and specifications. If they've not been sealed by the community issuing the documents, um, what you would do is I believe you would um, go into uh, let's see, you would, you would review that and integrate the work into your own technical, technical submissions. 
Um, that's allowed by rule eight, or statute 813454. Again, you're not, it's not like uh, you're not really, I don't think you're stamping, you're not plan stamping those, um, so to speak, but you are going to review that standard detail to make sure it works in whatever project you're designing. If it doesn't, obviously, um, you may not, you know, there's a couple options I think you could use. And again, I'm not a, a practitioner. But um, you could design your own detail and work with that jurisdiction um, or maybe potentially modify that um, detail. Um, again, uh, as I'm not a practitioner, um, but it definitely is worth, I think, a conversation with that municipality or village or, or city. Um, but I, I don't think there's really any huge issues with sealing. Um, unsealed details that a jurisdiction has. Again, after you do have to review those though. Uh, Rich asks, are there examples in legal precedents of architects or engineers who have been involved in a remediation and then become involved in litigation over building not of their original design? None that I am personally aware. And I'm not sure I'm aware of any one project or, or occurrence like that that's that's happened. Um, I've been with the board since 2008. So that's what, that's getting on 15 years. Yeah, I, I'm not, can't recall anything, Kelly, or Rich. Uh, Kelly asks, can you put a standard detail on your drawings that was produced by another ent entity and note as for reference only? I guess you could, um, but again, uh, I think if you use that, all the rule says that if you, if you use that, um, well, this says if it's used in a project, um, that might mean, again, I wanna throw out a big caveat here. I'm not a lawyer, so don't consider anything, uh, nothing I, I, I say should be construed as legal advice. Um, so I guess it would hinge on if that's, if it meets the definition of being used in a project. Hmm. If it's for reference only, not quite sure. Um, I might have to research that Kelly and get back to you. Uh, Mark asks, is remediation always done by third parties? Is architecture engineering a record not contacted first? Well, you know, I would say this, if, <clears throat> The vast majority of projects we've seen, if not all, um, the, the, the owner um, usually doesn't engage any licensees at all. Um, there's been very few cases where, um, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with trying to remember one project that had licensees on it to begin with that went through remediation, so. Yeah, I mean, if if the owner had architects or engineers of records on engaged at the beginning, I mean, there wouldn't be any need for remediation because they've already got the licensees on the project. Uh, does the remediation firm automatically become the querying professional? Potentially, um, if there's, let's say, a project has no licensees on it and an architect and engineer are involved in the remediation, uh, again, under the act, one of those individuals has to be the corn professional. Yes, they do. Is the board formalizing any policy or communication with relationships with partner agencies, um, AHJs, notification of owners? Um, this is something we've um, been trying to do for years. Um, uh, try to, to strengthen our outreach to um, partner agencies, local building departments, um, other folks, do you talk about potential compliance issues? And we, we made some headway. Um, we, for example, we had a, a, you know, daycare projects were a big um, or a huge compliance issue. We just started seeing a lot of daycares that should have had licensees but didn't. So we, we started a conversation with HHS division that deals with daycares and we've um, taken um, some huge turns with um, getting those projects. Well, we're, we're seeing less of those projects now. Uh, Jay asked, mentioned earlier, the board does not have jurisdiction 
um, political subdivision or agent. This mean a municipality can hire anyone to do design, even though design may interact um, public safety. Who would be the governing body, if not the board? <clears throat> Um, I'm going to have to research that one, Jay, and ask and, and get back to you on that one. Um, John asks, off topic, um, do you know of any state actually considering de-licensing architects to reduce government? Um, I haven't heard of any jurisdiction potentially um, with the exception possibly of Arizona. Um, and I don't believe those efforts have been recent. Those efforts were more focused on, um, they happened maybe two years ago. I wanna say they were more concerned with some other professions, but I, I wanna believe that architects might've gotten um, shotgunned into that, uh, into that group to potentially de-license. Um, so yeah, that's, I haven't heard of any real nationwide push um, to de-license anyone, but there has been a lot of effort of uh, what I've seen in, in some state legislatures is um, kind of undermining or eroding licensure um, requirements. And so that's something the board is really trying to keep their eye on. Uh, Mark asks, how do we support using specially manufactured drawings? Um, again, that's more, that's not really covered in the new rules. Um, they're not a jurisdiction. And again, I think, um, you know, if you're dealing with things like submittals, you know, reviewing if projects are, are, or, or, um, systems or products or, you know, meeting the requirements of a project you're designing. I think that's a different conversation than, than, um, what I've pre been presenting here. Um, David asks, what about a separate title act for structural engineering? Um, have not heard any talk about that in Nebraska. Um, there are, I think, uh, all, there's only one state that I'm aware of, Illinois, that has a separate structural engineering um, act. Um, but there has not, I have not seen a push for a separate title act for structural engineering. Um, Pat says a couple of years ago, a Nebraska senator wrote a bill to de-license architects along with other professions. Um, AIA and allied professionals got architects removed. Um, that's a good thing. Okay, I am cognizant of the time. Uh, hopefully I've answered everyone's questions here. Um, we will email evidence of attendance to attendees after the webinar. So be able to, uh, or look out to your email for that. Um, we will publish this webinar to the board's YouTube channel. Um, and we do have links here. Um, and we will also, so we'll, we'll, we've been recording this webinar. We'll post this up to YouTube along with a follow up PDF that we'll be able to uh, have available to everyone. Uh, so, again, um, I want to thank everyone for joining, and we did take up the whole hour. That's perfect. We hit it right in the nose. Um, and, again, have a great day, everyone, and take care.